Did you know that Ford almost made the Mustang front wheel drive? From its Mazda roots to the woman who engineered it with women in mind. This is everything you need to know! Take it up to speed on the Ford Probe. Now before we begin, all right, I want you to turn the lights down. I want you to get comfy. Open a nice bottle of wine or fancy root beer if you're under 21. I know it's 9 or 10 a.m. right now and you're probably on the toilet, but it's cool. It's summer, baby. Now go ahead and take a nice long look at that cork, all right? You looking? Great, because now I want you to ask yourself, is this cork a Mazda? Chapter one, the almost stang. Believe it or not, Mazda got its start by making corks. It began as the Toyo Cork Gogio Company in 1920. They invented their first vehicle, 1931 power tricycle, to specifically carry corks. The Mazda Go Auto Rickshaw was the first in what would be a long line of utilitarian vehicles. And it wasn't until the 60s with the Mazda R60 that they'd get into passenger cars. Even though they were building up a nice reputation with their rotary engines, the transition into the automotive world was rough. And by the end of the decade, they were looking to sell some stake in the company to help raise capital. Enter the Ford Motor Company. Around that time, Ford was looking to take advantage of the Japanese market and Ford thought, Mazda, that sounds good, I'll have that. Thus began the love story of Mazda and Ford. In 1971, they started to get all real hot and heavy with the Mazda B-Series pickup truck became the Ford Courier in North America. Not long after that, Ford was rebadging Mazda's commercial trucks in Asia. It was such a successful partnership that in 1979, Ford bought 25% of Mazda shares. You see, Ford needed access to some more fuel efficient vehicles because they were in the middle of an oil crisis. Muscle cars were taking a beating. By the early 80s, even the most speed-obsessed consumers had decided that the extra power wasn't worth the cost of filling their tank for, I don't know, $1 million adjusted for inflation. I'm not sure if that's actually 100% correct. I didn't Google it. The few pony cars that were selling were oftentimes the low-powered base models, like the base Mustang, which had a 2.3 liter four cylinder that made 88 horsepower. That's not a lot. That's like air cold beetle territory. Front engine, rear wheel drive was looking more and more like a thing of the past and the future was gonna be more economical platforms like the K car, Chrysler's cheap, reliable platform that ended up being the underpinnings of more than 50, yes, 50 different models. One chassis. Now, all of this led to Ford having an aha moment. You know what? I think I'm gonna have an aha moment myself. Take on me. Dude, we can't use that. We're gonna get sued. So, in 1982, Ford assigned Toshi Saito to start reimagining the Mustang as a. F as a. As a front. As a front. As a front, as a front wheel drive car codenamed the SN16. And wouldn't you know it, that same year, Mazda debuted their G platform, the company's first mid-size front wheel drive chassis. Huh, coincidence. It was the base for the Mazda Capella, the Mazda 626, and Ford Telstar. Yes, Ford was already badging cars on the G platform, so it was perfectly logical to take a long, hard look at swapping it for the then struggling Fox body Stangs. But thankfully, not everyone inside Ford was behind the idea. The most vocal critic of the plan was John Coletti. Now, he is the legendary designer behind the SVT team in the 90s. He's responsible for pretty much every cool Ford from the decade, and he absolutely hated the SN16. He tells a story of being on a tour of the design center with Ford VP Ken Dabrowski. They saw the models for the SN16, and John was like, what's that? And Ken explained all the cost benefits that the new model would have for the company. That may be a lot of things, but a Mustang, it ain't. His biggest problem with the design was the low cowl, the SN16, which much sleeker than the current Fox body Mustang. But that low profile meant that there'd be no room for a V8. Now, when Dabrowski told him there were no plans for a V8, John said his reaction was, I'd rather the Mustang name die than for it to be put on that. And I mean, honestly, you know what? He's not wrong. 
I'd love to know what he thinks of the Maki. <laughs> Anyway, John kicked his complaints up the chain of command and internally there came to be some apprehension about the dramatic change to the Mustang. I mean, the Fox body years have been good for the Mustang. Pairing the legendary five liter V8 with a four barrel carb and up the power to 175 horsepower right around the time that consumers were once again developing a tastement for displacement. They were sick for the quick. They had a desire for the fire on the tires and then there was the 1987 auto week cover story where writer chris sawyer revealed leaked details of the sn16 and the mustang community lost their freaking minds front wheel drive what no v8 double what are you freaking kidding me, Ford? We're gonna come up there to Dearborn and kick you in the nuts! One fan wrote in a letter to Auto Week and said, Tell Dearborn, I canceled my Mustang GT and ordered an IROC Z. Ford guys were the K-pop stands of the 80s. They called it the Mustang, which is pretty good. I think it's pretty good. I think the almost Stang is better. Anyway, all of this worked. The initial plan was to release the SN16 as the Mustang and release the Mustang as the Mustang Classic. But someone at Ford was paying attention to another PR nightmare going on, New Coke, and decided to just keep the Mustang the Mustang. And the SN16, much like my uncle who lives right outside of Area 51, it was about to get probed. Chapter two, it's probing time. At last, it's time to get probed. The SN16 wouldn't be the new Mustang after all, but Ford had a new problem because Mazda had already started construction on a facility to produce G platform cars in Michigan. And part of that construction contract said that Ford would be ordering a certain number of those cars. So the SN16 had to come out as something. So product planners got to work on introducing it as its own sports car model separate from the Mustang. They'd call it the Probe which was a name that they borrowed from a series of concept cars they made with Ghia in the early 1980s. And interestingly enough, the first of those concept cars was the Fox body. So that name technically had more in common with the Mustang than the SN16. Nothing is a coincidence, nothing. The result was Mazda on the inside, Ford on the outside, and pretty cool throughout i i like them the base model used mazda's f2 engine a 2.2 liter four cylinder that made 110 hertz per there was also a gt model that was more performance oriented <laughs> when the probe launched the gt used the same inline four but it added a turbocharger bringing it up to 145 hertz per the whole thing was so rad and a so late 80s way two years after it debuted the gt would switch over to using ford's naturally aspirated vulcan b6 it was smoother for sure but the gripe with the vulcan was that you really had to rev it out to get any power and even though it made an identical 145 hertz per it put out 25 less pound feet of twerks the base trims did have an automatic option but it was really bad as a lot of 80s automatics are but the gt came exclusively in a five-speed manual this thing was as sleek as a river otter covered in jelly had a long angular front end and a steeply raked windshield that made it look wedgy did it have pop-up up and down headlights <laughs> did it have pop-up up and down headlights does this answer your question pop, 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 up and down headlights the Probe was entering a very crowded market. By the late 80s, demand for compact sports cars was strong, like Nolan strong, particularly for Japanese models, which the Probe essentially was. Talking about the Honda Prelude, the Mitsubishi Eclipse, the Nissan 240SX, shouts to Nico from Canada. You wrote us a very nice letter. Tell your dad I said, what's up? And also the Toyota Celica were all eating up market share with both car people and normal people alike. But the probe held its own. In 1990, Jeffrey Collier set a track record at Daytona in a probe with an average speed of 166.553 miles per hour. That record still stands as the fastest closed course lap for a non-turbo four-cylinder powered car in the NASCAR Dash Series. And sure, that's an awful lot of qualifiers to count as a record, but still, it's 
Pretty cool nonetheless. Records are cool. Chapter three. Do, re, mi, mi. The probe was a success. There was a growing segment of buyers who wanted something sportier than a Taurus, but weren't after all the muscle car stats of the Mustang. By the way, at this point, the Mustang had fully recovered with its brush with front wheel drive. And Ford was well underway with designs for the SVT Cobra. And you know that the Kentucky Cobra is down with that. Cobras are so cool. They're so big. So vascular. They've got big old traps. Ford went to work on the second generation probe. This time, they understood what they had better than when they were dreaming of a Mustang replacement. It would still be mostly Mazda under the hood, but the look would be all Ford. And to look at that, let's meet Mimi Vandermolen. Mimi was responsible for the design of the new probe because she was the design executive for small cars, a first for a woman in the car industry. During World War II, Ford hired women for their design teams, the first being Leota Carroll, an illustrator who was brought on to do drafts. In the 40s, there were women designing instrument panels, ornamentation, color, trim, everything. But in a league of their own style waste of talent, they were all replaced by men returning from the war and Ford wouldn't hire another female designer until 1970 when they brought on Mimi Vandermolen when she was asked to work on Team Taurus. The Taurus exterior would be a radical new direction for Ford with soft curves that they called the rounded edge revolution. With the Taurus, she also revolutionized car interiors by applying her ergonomic wizardry. Tactile controls, you know, those little bumps on the buttons that you can feel so you don't have to take your eyes off the road? Mimi thought of that. She also changed the climate controls from being push buttons to more intuitive rotary dials and broke up the center stack into multiple zones rather than one straight line which made the driver reach far away for switches. Plus, she spent two and a half years and 100,000 miles prototype testing new seats. All of it added up to a game-changing car that would make up 25% of Ford North American sales. After the galactic hit that was the Taurus, Mimi was promoted to the executive level and the first car to come up for a refresh under her tenure was the Probe. Now with this car, she had a mission to design with female drivers in mind. And she was completely transparent about what she was up to. She said, if I can solve all the problems inherent to operating a vehicle for a woman, it'll be that much easier for a man to use. She lowered the front end to improve visibility for smaller drivers. She made the trunk door more lightweight. The moonroof slid out to protect big 90s hair. She did away with seat buttons that would rip pantyhose. The pedals were less bulky to make it easier to drive in heels. For the knobs and door handles, she made her male designers wear fake nails to understand the ease of operation. And wouldn't you know, this generation of probes would increase market share right out the gate. God, do you know what? It's almost like Mimi knew that if they made a car, more people would enjoy driving, then more people would buy it. For this generation, there were again, two drivetrains available. The base used the Mazda FS engine, a two liter inline four that delivered 115 hertz per. The GT though, used Mazda's KLDE, a 2.5 liter V6 that made 165 hertz per, which combined with a 2,900 pound curb weight, gave the GT a zero to 60 time of 7.1 seconds, which is fast for back then. <laughs> The second gen started out with strong sales and over the course of its run would see a few special appearance packages. The all around sickest of which was the 1994 Pro Wild Orchid. But by the mid 90s, sales had started to slow. Now this was a time of anti-gas crisis. Cheap fuel prices meant a huge uptick in cars like Ford's own super popular Explorer. By 1996, work was starting on a third generation Pro, but in a cruel twist of fate, the car that was originally designed to be the new Mustang ended up having its own design cribbed. What was to be the Gen 3 probe ended up being reimagined as a new sportier Cougar in an effort to attract younger people to Mercury. The last probe came out in 1997, putting an end to one of the most unlikely cars in Ford history. What began as Mustang owner's worst nightmare ended up being a success story of collaboration between American and Japanese automakers and lives in our hearts as one of the coolest American-ish compact sports cars 
of the 90s. Thank you guys for watching this video. Uh, if you want to watch more videos like it, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. We put out something new dang near about every day. I mentioned SVT in this episode. If you want to watch my video on that, check this out. Go get yourself some merch, donutmedia.com. Follow me on Instagram at James Pumphrey. Follow Donut at Donut Media. I love you.